being a financial advisor is one of the coolest jobs in the world. And I would encourage anyone who's even a little bit interested in finance to definitely look into some of the aspects of this job. But like anything else, nothing is perfect. So here are some of the seven things that I hate about my job. Number one is gonna be clients who are difficult to deal with, usually because they're being illogical or irrational or very emotional about a certain decision. Every single person makes decisions, at least a little bit based on emotional factors, but certain individuals seem to just be wired a little bit differently and also don't take any direct action towards trying to take emotion out of their decision making, and that can really come through when it comes to their finances. The instances where I've seen people's emotions be the most detrimental towards their decision making is in the instances where a loved one has passed away and they're now managing that person's money, which can be a really difficult scenario for anyone out there. People will have a huge amount of stress because they uh, they feel guilty that they are left with a sum of money or they feel like it is their job to keep the investment returns very high. They don't want to let the person down who passed away and let them left them with this money. So there are a lot of things that can be pulling on their thought processes when it comes to making decisions surrounding investment accounts, moving accounts around, whatever it might be. So when you're dealing with clients who are being very irrational and illogical because emotions are pulling on their decision making, the job's almost impossible. You'll see people making really bad decisions right in front of your eyes and you can't stop them from doing it. You can tell them the same thing over and over and over and you can study behavioral finance and try to know the best way to approach the the mental uh, state that they're in to help them make the right decision but some people will literally get locked down in their own ways or in the fear that they have in making a bad decision whatever it might be different things can happen to different people but that can make the job pretty stressful because you know what needs to happen people just don't take the advice number two would be when you are blamed for performance when you shouldn't be and i'm not just talking about when the market is down i think also when the market is up pretty well say a benchmark's up 12 percent for the year and clients portfolio is up 14 percent they outperformed by two percent this year that's a great year and we give them that information and you know, maybe they saw that the entire stock market was up 18, so they're not happy with that 14. Or they just don't really recognize the fact that being ahead of their benchmark by 2% this year is a great win. So from someone's perspective, knowing how difficult it can be to manage a portfolio well, you're like, hey, this is the best you're going to get in like the next 5, 10 years, possibly. And when they really don't appreciate any of that, it can be a little bit annoying. Or on the flip side of that, when you've actually underperformed, if the benchmark is up like 10% and your portfolio is up 8% and the client's saying, oh, thank you so much. I'm glad that the accounts are up. I see we're doing great this year. And you're kind of like, well, we did miss out on a little bit of performance for this reason, that reason, and they really don't care. Then it makes you feel a little bit guilty. Like this person should be a little bit upset at me at least. And they're actually really happy with me, even though I didn't do my job to what I wished I could have or why I expected myself to be able to do. So I don't know, that's kind of a weird scenario too. But certainly when the market goes down too, usually when the market's up, they will attribute that more to the, the market being good. But when the market's down, it gets more pointed towards you. Not with all clients, a lot of people will know, hey, you're doing the best you can in a down scenario. But even if the market's down 30% and someone's relatively conservative and their accounts are down 10, you'll get some clients who will be very upset about being down 10% and they'll assign most of that blame to you, even though maybe you told them to be relatively conservative because of you know their financial plan or whatever else you're working on with them. Uh, you save them 20% of this 30% drop because their portfolio is only down 10 and they're still upset at you. Really, they shouldn't be upset at you at all. They should be upset at maybe the economy for the stock market being down, but they should be happy with you for having them relatively conservative and avoiding some of those losses. It's going to differ case by case, but you'll just run into people who blame you too much for performance numbers when most of it's obviously based on the market performance and their asset allocation. The next one on my list is going to be difficult paperwork. Sometimes you'll be working with an individual and you know the best route for someone and you recommend they do a certain thing and they're all on board with that. And then you go to get the paperwork, say you're transferring from a 403B. I'm using that as an example because 403Bs are notoriously difficult to handle from a logistical paperwork perspective. And you submit transfer forms, but then the 403B company wants you to sign their transfer forms as well. You send them off to the client, you send them in and they say, hey, we needed a medallion stamp on this. Client has to find a bank or credit union that can medallion stamp. Then uh, the 403B company will maybe require a letter of acceptance from your institution that you're gonna invest the money for the client. Then sometimes your institution won't want to generate a letter, letter of acceptance because this isn't like an applicable scenario. The 403B company just has this weird requirement for this one. Things can come up where you'll go two, three months, especially like estate settlements when you're trying to process paperwork to beneficiaries and there's maybe five beneficiaries of an estate and some of them aren't sending forms back to you. 
months and months on end where you know exactly what you want to happen and the client's on board with that same thing happening but you just can't get it done because the paperwork's holding you up. Sometimes you're faxing forms to third-party providers. You don't know if they've gotten the forms and then like maybe they didn't accept them, but they didn't tell you why. And then months later you submit it again and they're like, it creates a second case. And you go back to the first case and say, how do I fix this? And you try to fix the first one, but now they're working on the second and nothing happens. And all the while, sometimes client can be getting pretty mad at you because they're like, hey, you told me we should do this. I said, yes, I signed some paperwork for it and it's just not happening. So whenever you're dealing with institutions that aren't the firm that you're clearing through, the paperwork can be really ugly. I would say it's fairly common. 20% of the time you run into these paperwork issues that slow everything down. I think they can hurt clients. They can hurt you and your business when you're not getting things done. They can hurt relationships because people won't have as much trust in you if you don't do what you said you were going to do because the paperwork became a problem. All of these things are terrible. So as much electronic and automated paperwork that we have now, I'm a fan of it. And the more and more we can move in that direction, I think it's gonna be better. One of the best solutions to this is having a really well-trained and really smart team uh, or staff working with you or for you because they'll be experienced in these types of paperwork issues. They'll know exactly what has to happen. They'll know the right parties to give a phone call to to get things straightened out, to get the client moving in the right, right direction. There's a big difference in what an inexperienced or just non-motivated staff person can accomplish when there's paperwork issues versus what a experienced and motivated staff person can accomplish when there's paperwork issues. I've seen it time and time again, it's just so much better at getting to the bottom of what's wrong. Uh, sometimes I'm in the same scenario and I'm the person trying to get to the bottom of what's wrong and I've done something before and I recognize, wow, I'm glad I've ran into this situation before so that I know how to get this one done. Number four is gonna be compliance. I wanna be careful about this because I think compliance offices are in place for a very good reason. I think they serve a very important and good role and I think that they do a good job in 90% of cases especially given the amount of fraud and theft that has occurred in the financial advice industry over the last 50 years but certain compliance departments or certain compliance officers go a little bit too far in their understanding of the way certain FINRA rules or SEC rules or Department of Labor rules are written and need to be enforced and they'll make things way too difficult regular day-to-day -day activities that you should be able to get done in three buttons through a computer system they'll become way too difficult because the compliance red tape is far more than it needs to be for a certain scenario they monitor communications social media posts they monitor uh, financial transactions, they monitor uh, trades, they monitor money movement requests, wire transfers, all these types of things, especially with wires, that one is very important to monitor actually, so I'll cut compliance people a break on that one. But it just seems like so often I spend an extra 45 minutes you know, submitting more paperwork to a compliance officer about why we submitted a certain thing the way we did, when I would consider the documentation that's already on file to be sufficient for any regulator but you know, the compliance officer wants more or the compliance department wants more. It just slows things down. It can be relatively annoying. So compliance red tape, compliance oversight, especially if the person is like really heavy handed, which I've only ran into once in my career. But if you have a heavy handed compliance person who wants to wield all the power, then they're definitely gonna put a stop to a lot of what you're working on just because they can. That can be extremely frustrating. That's not common by any means, but you definitely run into that type of thing. So compliance can can be relatively annoying in this job. Next is gonna be the sales part of this job. That's really gonna depend on what type of firm you're working in. Some RAs, if you're in a client service role, working towards being a salaried advisor will have almost zero sales responsibilities. But if you're like a broker at a wirehouse, probably 90% of your job is gonna be sales responsibilities. And then other people are responsible for giving the clients their forms and conducting meetings and things like that. You're really just a sales rep for certain products that that wirehouse or bank might be selling. Any sales role can be relatively stressful when you have high quotas that you need to hit, but especially when you're sitting across the table from someone who thinks you have their best interests in mind or they think you're their fiduciary, you're giving them financial advice because they wanna do what's best. And really, if you're in a scenario where you're, you're not considering all the options for this person, not through any direct fault of your own, but just because the corporation that you work for or the company you work at, uh, doesn't ask you or won't let you consider any options. They just have one product or one line of service that you need to be selling to this client that's sitting across the table from you. Client might pour their heart out to you, tell, tell you about their life story and what they want to accomplish this and that. And you go, okay, yeah, that, that sounds great. Here's the life insurance product I think you need to buy for that. That would just be, um, it, it can make you feel pretty guilty, I think, especially when this industry is coming under more and more pressure for advisors being salespeople rather than fiduciaries for their clients. More and more clients are looking out for that type of thing. So when you're in like a sales first role in this industry, that can be a really negative experience. I hate wearing suits. You can probably tell if you've watched this channel for long enough, 
I rarely have a shirt and tie on. I hate neckties. I hate starchy clothes. The pants, the shoes are slippery and they're stiff. I hate the whole thing. I don't think suits look good. This is a rant, by the way, so please don't be offended if you love suits. We have people in the office who love suits and, and I'll compliment them on their suits. For me personally, I would much rather go my whole life wearing jeans and a t-shirt or shorts and a t-shirt and never have to worry about all this formalities ever again. Personally, for me, this is the number one thing I hate the most about my job, and maybe the only thing that I would actually say I truly hate, because all these other things are kind of smaller complaints, but I can't put it at number one on this list just because I know a lot of people like to dress well, and a lot of clients like to see when they're a uh, professional that they're working with, doctor, lawyer, financial advisor, whatever, dresses well. So it's an important part of the job, but I don't think it's gonna remain this way forever. I'm biased because I hate wearing suits and shirts and ties and everything else, it just seems to me like over the past 50 years, you know, people used to wear suits in their house. Well, that's gone away. Then at least everyone wore suits in their job. That kind of gone away. Job places are getting more casual. And now in the remaining roles where people still kind of wear suits, that's going away a little bit more and more too. Even in this business, there are offices that are 100% casual, random rock and roll t-shirts and jeans you can wear to the office. So that's going to become more and more commonplace, which I'm definitely a fan of because I hate wearing uncomfortable and dopey looking suits. Another thing that a lot of people deal with in the finance industry is working with people who have really big egos or try to build up their own ego by putting other people down. I'm extremely grateful to work at an office where this literally almost never happens. At least I can't remember any instance in which this happened. But in a lot of financial advising offices, this is a serious problem where either your client's investment returns are better than someone else's or you know what the stock market's going to do or you've brought in more new clients or more new assets throughout the course of the year and it's just like this projection of trying to be better and smarter than everyone else in your office putting other people down that's a really toxic environment to work in i've heard of a few firms where this is especially uh, a problem so i'm not going to name the names here watch my best broker dealers for financial advisors to work at video if you want to hear more about that it can be a really difficult scenario if you are getting like emotionally beat up every day when you go into work. Of course, you're going to hate that job. You're never going to want to go into the office. So people in that scenario, I, I totally feel for. And you definitely should jump ship, in my opinion, because there are plenty of offices around the country where that is not a problem anymore. I think it was probably more so a problem in like the 90s and 2000s. People are becoming more and more kind in this business because I think people realize that kindness wins out over long periods of time. If you're still watching this video, I thank you very much for sticking around and watching the whole thing. My last point is that it takes me away from making YouTube videos, which I've really been enjoying doing recently. So if you made it to the end of this one, I'll ask that you leave a comment down below and just say, hey, made it to the end or something like that. I'll reply to you, say thanks or, or drop you a like, whatever it might be. People like you help my channel grow. So if you could like this video, subscribe to the channel. Both of those things really help me out and I appreciate them. As always, thanks again for watching.